You are now locked into Radio Juxtapose, the home of contemporary art and culture conversation. Coming up today. I mean, I think one of the things that distinguishes our identity over a city or a museum in a major metropolitan city like New York is that we have a lot of people who do travel through this area and who come to the museum, but our primary audience is our residents and people who live here in this region. Something I think that we do differently is really try to develop those connections to the people who live here. This is Radio Juxtapose. Hello, hello, hello. How's everybody doing? As I sit in my kitchen and record the beginning of this podcast, episode 57 of Radio Juxtapose, I, I usually have a joke to make or some sort of quip. But uh, I think like many people uh, around the world, and especially our American listeners, I'm a, a bit exhausted. And I think I felt that there'd be some sort of resolution to talk about uh, this week. And there's not really a resolution to talk about in a weird way. Feel a bit, uh, divided, um, as ever, but I'm excited about introducing this particular podcast because I think there's a lot to learn about it. We are speaking with curator Lauren Applebaum, who put together a fantastic show, Radical Tradition, American Quilts and Social Change at the Toledo Museum of Art. And this conversation came about um, because of our fall 2020 cover artist Bisa Butler having work in this show in particular her work um, depicting Frederick Douglass and one of the things that's so fascinating about this conversation in contrast to the conversations that we're having via social media at the moment is that this is a show about passing along stories through generations in a physical way And I love the way that Lauren explains so many different cultures and how different different people can connect to quilts in a way that is, I guess, so much different than I think I always thought about the quilt. I also think the timing of this is particularly strong in regards to the fact that we're speaking with a curator from the Toledo Museum of Art. And juxtapose, we often fall into the trap, um, and I, I admit this, that we fall into the trap of speaking only to the coasts And this is a really, really great opportunity for us to speak to a curator working at the Toledo Museum of Art, kind of talking about the rich tradition of museum collections that exist in the Midwest. And I think after this week where we're all sort of trying to find our footing about what has happened and what continues to happen, not only in America, but just around the world in terms of how we interpret interpret art history and art historical narratives, um, it's really fantastic to speak about an art form that is labored over and passed along in not a social media tweet facebook post but something that's labored over and loved and and tells um, a more collective story about who we are and where we're going so this is a very exciting conversation with lauren applebaum if you haven't listened to our conversation with bisa butler um that is a couple podcasts ago and the museum show itself opens later this month, later later this November 2020. The art world doesn't just exist with artists and curators on the coast. There are so many people who work at museums, work at galleries, and work in the art world um, that have been affected by the closings um, during the pandemic and the, the delays and the uncertainty of where their jobs um, are headed. And um, Lauren gives us a really, really great insight about how the Toledo Museum of Art handled this, this really crazy year and what it meant um, putting together a show such as this during a time when radical change was actually happening on the streets of America. So this is a great conversation. Thank you so much. Lauren, hi. Hello. Doug and I have been wanting to speak with a museum curator almost the whole year since the pandemic started just to kind of get you know, we've heard so much from artists who've had almost no change. Like we go to a studio, we just paint. Like, it, it, or we we do what we do. We do our craft. The the pandemic didn't change our schedule, but for for us, maybe on our end of the other side of the art world, lots of stuff changed. So, 
maybe go through those first initial months of the uncertainty of when things were going to come back. Yeah. Um, so when everything, I mean, everything kind of shut down pretty abruptly in mid-March and we didn't know how long it would be that way. Um, everybody started working from home and, you know, for me, I was kind of getting towards the end of the process of organizing an exhibition. So it was actually pretty good timing. It, it ended up working out really well. I had already secured most all of the loans for my show. So I was in the writing process. And so, you know, I mean, maybe similar to an artist, like, you know, having the luxury of just working in their studio. I was just at my desk at home, like in writing mode. So that's kind of where I was at. But I think as an institution, you know, we were reassessing everything, like how in, you know, a world where we can't have our public and our community coming in into our doors, how do we bring our collection to them? And so it definitely changed a lot of the way that we engage with our community. How so? We started, I mean, in terms of the curatorial staff, we started making a lot of videos about works in our collection and using social media and just trying to like rethink how we use our virtual tools and social media to um, engage with our public. So, you know, sharing information about works in the collection, showcasing pieces that, you know, are either everybody's favorite or works that people are less familiar with and um, just sharing more information about those. Do you think, and I've been wondering this too, do you think that's something that's been overdue in the museum and institutional level in general that uh, these sort of maybe kind of kind of techniques to get people to learn about the museum that are using social media in, in, in more proactive ways was something that you guys maybe needed to do anyway? Yeah, I mean, I th it's something that I think a lot of museums have been doing. I mean, every museum has a social media account and are, you know, always coming up with new creative ways to share information about what's going on. But I think you know, for us, it's also, it's been a way to expand our audience. We are able to not just focus on in-person programming with people who live in the Toledo area. We are um, hopefully reaching out to other communities across the country. Can a museum exist without a museum? That's a really <laughs> You're going question. with that early, Doug. That's a, <laughs> you're going for the... You know, I know ultimately, although that's an interesting question because this museum actually started without a museum and without a collection. It started with an idea. Yeah, it was, you know, our our founders, he was a glass industrialist and he had moved to Toledo from Massachusetts. Um, his name was Ed, Edward Drummond Libby and he started the Libby Glass Company, um, you know, moved to this region for the natural gas resources and for the sand quality. And, um, you know, he and his wife were, you know, big patrons of the arts. They had a big interest in bringing the arts to the community. And so with without a collection or anything, they decided to found a museum. It was, you know, very community oriented from the beginning. And they relied upon community members to, to collect art and to donate art. And the whole kind of founding mission was art education. So ever since that time, we've been free to the public. There is like this long history, especially in that region of the United States, of kind of those early industrialists opening up museums with their collections. And it's kind of, I think, I think it's often a, to use slang, but like a slept on region for the great collections that exist there and the great museums that exist there is... Can you maybe talk about even your, I don't know where you are from originally, but like maybe your education of how these collections were made, in, especially in this particular region of the United States? Yeah. So oddly enough, I am actually from Toledo. Oh, cool. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> it's perfect then. I should reframe that question as <laughs> the history so of ar art collecting in the institution of which you're from. Okay. Yes. So for me, um, you know, the Midwestern Art Institution was all that I knew. It was it was the first thing that I had access to growing up. Um, and it's been that way here forever. I mean, my my grandmother grew up in Toledo and when she was a little kid, she would come to the museum for, you know, Saturday afternoon art classes. And so she kind of passed that down to me. And, um, you know, she was an artist and an illustrator and you know, she would bring me to classes at the art museum. And so this, this was like, 
this was the place. Um, we have a great studio program and that provides ways for kids growing up in the, in the Midwest to have access to an art education. And so that's really, you know, that's where I came from and what I grew up with. How else has 2020 started to affect the museum? There was a huge movement um, within Black Lives Matter of trying to change things. And has this disrupted you at all in any way? Yeah, I mean, I think that this has been such a tumultuous year. And I think that, you know, in a good way, like when you have these kinds of movements that um, spring up and protests like that is your community telling you that you know you need to do a better job and I think museums across the country are taking this time to really look inside themselves and reflect on how you know maybe historically they have contributed to systemic racism and um, to think about how they can overcome that and, and do a better job and, and engage with their communities in more meaningful ways. And that's, that's definitely something that, you know, like institutions everywhere that we're doing here. Did you have to have some hard conversations during that period? Yeah. I mean, we're always having hard conversations. Um, I think that when you're, when you're reassessing how, how it is that you're engaging with your community and how you can, um, you know, most effectively create an equitable um, institution for everybody that, you know, it, sh it shakes up everybody's idea of what it is that we're doing here. Most specifically, you were working on a show called Radical Change at a time when radical change was happening in America, not only America, globally. So... I, I wonder at what point in the middle of putting together a show like this, like, does your, do you start shifting? Does your brain start going in different places? Do you reassess how you're approaching the show? Like you have to walk us through a little bit of that kind of internalized thinking of how you're going to do this show. Yeah. So a couple of years ago when I, when I first arrived at the museum, I decided to organize a show on American quilts called Radical Tradition, American Quilts and Social Change, um, you know, which comes a lot out of the research that I've been doing on quilts for a number of years now. And yes, like they're <laughs> in the process of organizing that show, there has been a lot of social change. And, you know, I think, I mean, for me, like these conversations and these things have been going on for a number of years now. So, um, I think it was something that was already on my mind and I think a lot of people's minds, um, but it really came to the fore, uh, you know, amid the pandemic and with, you know, after George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and all of the riots or sorry, all of the protests that have been going on, you know, about race relations in this country. And, you know, it, it definitely, I mean, for me, it, I'm, I'm glad in a way that this exhibition is opening right now. I mean, I think that it's incredibly topical and I, I really hope that it'll resonate with people. And it's helped us, you know, amid this time, we, we have thought about ways that we can, you know, without being too kind of reactive, that we can seize on this moment and create ways to reach out to our community that, you know, give them a chance to respond and uh, share what it is that they've been going through. And so, um, Kind of amid all of that, this past spring, we started, uh, you know, collaborating with our education department at the museum. We started a virtual quilting bee um, to really, you know, tie it closely to the theme of the exhibition and put out a put out a call um, in the community, but also across the country for people to submit quilt blocks that respond specifically to what's been going on in the country, you know, to to the quarantines, to, you know, we we got submissions that were um, kind of celebrating our healthcare workers and commemorating like what it is that they're doing. You know, maybe commemorating family members who have suffered from COVID and maybe who've died from COVID, and also you know responding to uh, to the protests and to um, what's been going on in terms of race in this country as well. So it's, it's been a really fruitful and interesting project. And we have been working with a local 
company in um, the Toledo area, the Electric Quilt Company, which is going to be helping us kind of virtually stitch all of these quilt blocks together so that we can um, share them with everybody and have them on display in the museum during the run of the exhibition. How do you feel then within an institution that it is to kind of make these sort of subtle, almost political statements? That's a really good question. I think you know, it's it's become clear, like if it wasn't clear kind of over the past several years, like it's definitely become clear over the past several months that, you know, museums need to to be there for their communities. And, you know, I don't really view it as much of a political statement as it is just, you know, making a space for our community and for people who've kind of historically been held at the margins to have a chance to express themselves and to have a space to talk about and make art about their own experiences. It's funny. I, I was, I was doing research about the show and I apologize for getting the name wrong. I was, my, my brain was jumbled in a couple thoughts um, about like how the quilt really has been this kind of interesting collaborative medium for people to kind of express either loss or to tell stories. I had totally forgot about the AIDS Memorial quilt and, um, and how much that like that was part of especially growing up in San Francisco how that was such part of like this kind of story about the history of kind of like what our city was going through um and then and just that collaborative thing and so when you were talking about how members of the museum or people who are visitors to the museum contributing to something like that it it's fascinating how the quilt has got this like durability in storytelling uh, that a lot of mediums don't um were you attracted to the quilt in your studies? I know you have a PhD in the arts. Like, was the quilt something that always kind of registered with you? Yeah, um, that, so no, actually. I mean, I grew up with quilts. Um, you know, I think that everybody has a story or a connection to quilts. Like, it's just such a part of the fabric of our our country. And um, so in that way, like, I think subconsciously, Everybody thinks about quilts, but I was actually coming at the topic um, through the lens of like the Industrial Revolution and new technologies in in the 19th century. I mean, that's that's really what my my research about quilts during my PhD um, really focused on. Sorry, I forget what your original question was. About. No, I'm, I'm, I get, I guess I'm asking is that you know, okay, so Doug and I amazingly, you know, have actually done podcasts with a bunch of textile artists, and uh, actually have had three podcasts centered around quilts. We did one with uh, the artist Ben Venom from San Francisco who does quilts. We did a podcast um, with Andrew Edlin who runs the Outsider Art Fair, uh, and that tended to lean heavily on. G's Bend and the quilt history in America. And then we had one with Bisa Butler recently. We also have had a podcast with Lucy Sparrow, who is a textile artist. So we have actually, oddly, as kind of a magazine that kind of works around the fringes of the art community, have actually focused a lot on textiles and quilts. So I guess, what is it like for you? Like, what was it that attracted you to it? And have you just noticed that these kind of art forms show up in so much of American history that it's it, it kind of goes without saying you're going to cover this stuff. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's really just that quilts connect with so many people on so many different levels. They are totally cross-cultural. They are, you know, they span socioeconomic backgrounds. Like people make quilts from who are coming from a lot of different places and experiences. And something that I thought was really compelling um, in my research on historical quilts is how, you know, we, a lot of people who maybe don't have as much of a background on quilt history, think of them as these, you know, they're objects that provide comfort and warmth. And they, um, you know, we, we look back on them as like these nostalgic things that are maybe family heirlooms that are passed down. But, you know, there's this whole tradition from so many different um, facets of culture of quilts that are, you know, used as tools for raising awareness, expressing opinions, and even, you know, inciting social change. And I think at a time 
you know, especially in the 19th century when um, women in particular didn't have a lot of the same rights that men had, you know, quilt making was this site where they could um, kind of come together and organize networks and, you know, talk about how they wanted to further their cause, you know, with like, issues having to do with women's suffrage or the temperance movement. Um, so I think, you know, quilts are incredibly powerful objects in that way. And, and they're also great storytelling tools. I wonder um, how being a curator in, in the Midwest is compared to if you were in a museum and, you know, one of the coasts, like what's, what, what, what makes that different to, to, to that role? I'm not really sure because I, you know, I haven't organized a quilt show in a coastal city. Fair enough. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I can say that like whenever I tell people that I'm organizing this show, no matter where I am, um, people always have something to say about it. People get really excited. People who I thought I knew really well will end up telling me like stories about you know, their family's history of quilt making or about quilts that they, you know, have folded up in a closet in their house. And, you know, as I've traveled around, um, you know, thinking about this show and, and looking at works uh, for a potential loan for this show that's happened in cities all over the country. Do you think the role? Yeah. Oh, no, no, go on. Oh, go I was no, just going to no, ask no, if go you go think ahead. the role of the museum then changes in any way between being in the Midwest to being on, you know, to being in New York. The, the role or the, the identity? I mean, I think one of the things that distinguishes our identity over, you know, a city or a museum in a major metropolitan city like New York is that we have a lot of people who do travel through this area and who come to the museum, but our primary audience is our residents and people who live here in this region. Um, and so something I think that we do differently is really try to develop those connections to the people who live here. Is, is this show for you? Um, it, you were kind of getting into this and you have so many, there's, there's contemporary elements to the show and there's the great history. It's kind of runs through it. Um, maybe talk a little bit about some of these, like, cause Bisa Butler is on the cover of juxtapose this, this issue. Uh, maybe talking a little bit about some of the contemporary trends in how quilt making has evolved and if or if it is something that has doesn't have actually a contemporary language it's it, it's something that holds on to something that's 150 years old and kind of grows from there yeah no that's a great question and i'm really glad well i know that Bisa is on the cover of uh juxtaposed and she's actually on the cover of the catalog for this exhibition as well um we're really excited to have her work featured and yeah i mean it's like over the past several years, quilt making has definitely popped up a lot in um, contemporary artist practices. And I mean, that's one of the reasons why this show kind of took the form that it did. Like as I was researching, I was seeing all of this really compelling work that's being made now that is incorporating quilts, whether, you know, using quilts as surfaces to paint on or um, kind of converging quilt making practices with other kinds of craft practices to sort of blur the lines between the two different media. You know, I think that that craft and and quilt making is is one place where we can look to um, explore voices and artists who have traditionally not um, you know held a space as much in, in a museum institutional context like, Quilts are often, you know, traditionally made by women and by uh, people of color. And, you know, um, I think that's one of the reasons why this sort of craft fine art dichotomy um, has really held for as long as it, as it has. It's, it's about who the makers are and who the voices are behind those objects. And so I think in this moment where there is um, definitely an impetus to uh, disrupt those hierarchies and those power structures. You see a lot of contemporary artists using those media that have been marginalized in, in order to do that. Is there, I was just going to ask if there was a, another craft that had the same kind of characteristics and 
uh, uh, that you've just talked about with quilt making. Yeah, I mean, I think something that's unique about quilts is that it's just it's so uh, easy to do in a way like everybody can kind of get textiles and fabrics in their homes and, and put a quilt together. But other, you know, other craft media are, you know, like ceramics, um, weaving, you know, even even knitting, crocheting, like there are all of these uh, kinds of needle crafts that um, that I think are coming about in the work of contemporary artists. Did you find yourself ever researching how other countries have used the, the quilt traditionally? Like, is there um, other parts of the world, since we are an international podcast, that are there other parts of the world that use the quilt or utilize the quilt in a way similar to a way America does? Um, that's a really good question. I mean, so my background is American art, and that is what I have focused on for the most part. That's a good but, you know, Joe making... card there. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to play this one, please. I don't know if I don't know if the Finnish do quilts. Okay, you know, quilt making is a practice that was developed thousands of years ago, and it is a very international practice. Um, and it, I think that you know, in parts of Europe and especially the UK, there's a, a similar history. I think to quilt making as there is in the US. But certainly, I think in the United States, there's this mythology that has developed around it. And it's become really uh, closely tied to this, you know, ideas about American history. Yeah, it's it's interesting, because I was thinking about this, I was writing something recently about what is, you know, the I always think of like, what is American art? And if you go to a museum, you get like the Hudson River School era landscape paintings, and then you kind of have this absence of, I don't know, what, what's going on. And then it's like, I always lean towards like quilts, craft, and graffiti as being like these kind of American sort of art forms. It's kind of odd how we've sort of adopted this particular craft as kind of an, a true American art form. Does does the, uh, this might be completely disconnected. The, no, I love it. The Louis. Industrial Revolution, where does this fit into it? I love this. Does it? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, if you think about it, what is a quilt made of? You know, right. it's sure. if you think about textile manufacturing, I mean, before textile mills started popping up around uh, New England, fewer quilts were made. I mean, it was fabric was had to be imported and it was really expensive. And only, you know, typically like you had to be you had to have some money to, to get this fabric in order to make, and it would typically be like a whole cloth quilt and the focus would be on, on the, the needlework. And with the industrial revolution and the rise of textile production in um, textile mills, you have this explosion of fabric and it's, it's cheaper and easier to access. And so people of, you know, more modest means are able to, um, get the materials that they need. And that's when you see like patchwork quilts coming about. There are all of these different patterns and colors and that people want to use. And maybe they're dressmakers and they save the the pieces that they had been using for making their clothes and incorporate those into their quilts. What got you into that? Um, it was really something else. I mean, so I I got into this through like coursework that I was taking as a graduate student. Um, I was thinking about how to, you know, what I wanted to write about in my dissertation. And I was thinking about the emergence of new technologies in the 19th century. And um, specifically, actually, communication technologies and how they were, um, you know, impacting artistic production during that period. You know, you think about technologies like the telegraph and the telephone coming about and, you know, and then the transatlantic telegraph in the 1850s, and this was a totally transformative moment. And so on one hand, there were all of these like utopian ideas floating around about, um, you know, the promise of global harmony that these technologies could create. And then, you know, on the other hand, there were these fears about the broader implications of these technologies. And, you know, I think that's something that we're definitely, um, experiencing today and that are, that's playing out in a lot of different ways with, you know, the internet. And so if we think about an artist's work as like a creative expressive act, it's like a form of communication. And so I was looking at how artists of that period were developing new 
communicative strategies and formal languages and their art making practices um, amid all of these emerging communication technologies. When you're when you're a curator for a show like this, do you feel the need to hammer people over the head with that idea that like, hey, we're going through these like transitory evolutions in communication now? So were they 150 years ago and here like, or do you <laughs> sort? No, I mean, I'm serious. Like, cause I struggle with this as a writer all the time. Like, do I just say it or do I just sort of let it germinate and let people kind of draw their own conclusions? Like, how do you sort of find yourself trying to explain that? Cause you just explained it beautifully just now. And I'm like, my whole brain's like so many things, but like, do you feel the need to over explain that to an audience who's going to walk into an exhibition? This is more about any exhibition, really. An exhibition that's doing it really well, you don't have to be so heavy handed about it. I think that if you really let the work speak for itself and, you know, that, that those parallels should just kind of naturally come about. Like there are times when I'm writing a wall label and I think like, you know, I should be really explicit about this, but I don't have the word count to explain it. And then, you know, you, you think like, well, this is evocative. And if, you know, I think that if I just sort of gesture to it, people's minds will go there anyway, because it's, you know, things like communication technology and social media, for example, are so much a part of our lives today. Like, how could you not? What is the, you know, sort of going back to what we kind of talked about right. back at the start, what does the, the next year look like for a museum? Because... I assume that the museum, and we know the museum's open, but I assume it's ticketed at a certain time, so there's not like thousands of people wandering around. That, I mean, that's a great question. And I think that depending on who you ask from different institutions, the answer is going to be completely different. We have a, basically, I mean, we have a task force that's been created to help make sure that everything in the museum is safe. Uh, we've been working with um, a team of medical professionals who can help us make sure that what we're doing throughout the museum is, you know, we're keeping everything effectively clean. We, you know, only let a certain number of people in it at any given time. So we do have time tickets. Um, and, you know, we, we opened in late June and we're just kind of taking it, you know, day by day and week by week. We've been moving forward with our exhibitions and luckily um, nothing has had to be canceled at this point. I think you know, some instances where um, things are changing a lot have to do with programming. Um, we've had to completely shift our ideas about programming because we, in the past, typically do a lot of um, on-site, in-person programming. We have a lot of art classes. And so, you know, our instructors are having to think about how to make things more virtual. Um, we, you know, I think I mentioned earlier on that one of our founding missions is art education. And so we have a really strong... Um, connection with the Toledo public school system. And our education department has um, been working really closely with them. Are museums in the US, like, are they supported and safe? Or is it like a tumultuous year for them, you know, just to even, you know, stay afloat? It sounds like a lot of museums have been having a difficult time. I think, you know, my experience here is that we've had to think really carefully about the kinds of things that we want to prioritize. But, um, you know, luckily at the Toledo Museum, things uh, have been relatively stable amid all of the chaos. It would be, uh, even though this is going to come out probably right after the uh, election next week. <laughs> um, uh oh. What? No, <laughs> no. This is this isn't gonna be like that that groundbreaking of a question, but um, how does a museum sort of set itself, kind of in an election year, um, with the backdrop of so much sort of social chaos? And you're in Ohio, which is you know a battleground state. In California, we we vote. No one really even comes here and visits, but we vote. Um, Ohio is such the centerpiece of the American election every year. So like, does the museum set up like voting education centers or like how, how does the, the museum like kind of center itself around an election, especially in Ohio, since many of our listeners will be like, this is the battleground state. Yeah, that's a really good question. I think that 
that would be something to ask our marketing and communications department. <laughs> That's a second card you're playing there. <laughs> I don't have a follow up to that. <laughs> <laughs> I, thought, I thought we were good for a little minute. So, do you have to be quite? I assume you have to be quite careful when you're um, positioning yourself in, in 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 any form of political conversation as a museum. Yeah, I think. I mean, I would. You know, I think that we would like to encourage everybody to vote. I think that's the most important thing that we all can do. Like, that's what this is all about. Is having a platform to i mean it's not like there's some museums in san francisco i know of that are like voting centers i'm not saying like it's it's happening here i was just curious how like how how it is happening there do you think these these virtual and digital spaces then can um can really can hold their own for for education for experience to 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 really tap into people about art or you know you said you're you said earlier at the start that your audience was actually expanding are you still able to give people some semblance of that experience? Uh, and do you feel confident that these are these are spaces that we're going to be maybe occupying more a little bit in the future? Yeah, I mean, I so, you know, speaking as an art historian, I don't think there's anything that can replace that in-person encounter that you have with the object. Like, that's something that's really special and really magical. But, you know, I think that even after things kind of go back to normal and we're able to host programs here in person, I would imagine that, you know, having that virtual component to our programming portfolio would be something that we would continue to do because we are able to, to reach people who don't live here or who aren't able to come in in person. Um, and I think that it's been working really effectively. Like one of, one of the things that we've been doing, um, you know, since one of our founding missions is to provide art education and as a school child, as a school child growing up here, I remember like, you know, every year coming to the museum with my class and learning about history through the objects. Um, so since school is remote for so many kids, um, you know, we've partnered with Toledo public schools to provide virtual art enrichment for kindergarten through eighth grade students. Um, which I think is serving like around 15,000 students this fall. And so we're able to, you know, develop a suite of digital activities and self-guided learning to help supplement um, the art education classes that they would have had had they been able to come on site. So, um, you know, I think that people have been responding really positively to that um, so far, which is great. And, you know, in terms of the exhibition programming, you know, I had been hoping to have a number of artists come here and, you know, give lectures and do conversations and maybe even host quilt making workshops in person. And so I have had to rethink a lot of that um, and switch things over to kind of a more virtual um, programming. So we do have some exciting events coming up. Do you have a memory of, since you're from Toledo and you used to go to the museum as a kid, do you have a, like a memory of a favorite exhibition from, from the museum's past? Oh my gosh. Um, that's a really great question. When I was a kid growing up here, I really just remember like certain works from the permanent collection that I would encounter. And they were probably like all of the, you know, key highlights that our, uh, docents would stop in, in front of and tell us all about. You know, we have this incredible, like huge Matisse mural. It's a ceramic mural that you see when you first walk in. It's really colorful. And as a kid, I remember seeing that. Um, but, you know, later, once I knew that I wanted to go into this as a field, um, I had, you know, internships here. And I remember working on um, an exhibition of psychedelic posters nice. that uh, was really, I think, maybe the first major exhibition that I that I had a hand in uh, working on. And that was definitely really fun. So wait, why do you, why do you think you have these kind of you have you've mentioned that now it's like a little bit of an inkling towards kind of that more outsidery vibe is that something that you just kind of did you find a like just really great historical kind of uh stories linked to those kind of movements because i mean poster art a lot of those people were highly educated in the arts but uh it's still not your typical museum uh show 
That's a great question. And I mean, I hadn't, that hadn't actually occurred to me until you've just said it, but I don't know, psychedelic posters and quilts. I feel like you're kind of, you're, you're coming from left field, which is great. Those, I mean, like I said, it's, it's the kind of work that a lot of people can relate to. And they do tell really interesting countercultural stories that, you know, don't often get as much attention. I think with like at that point in my life anyway, like the psychedelic posters also really intersected a lot with like the music that I was interested in listening to. And in a museum context, especially finding ways to make art relevant to people is something that I'm really attracted to. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Um, Do you know, just I, I just assume all curators have one just just sitting there burning, ready to go. Percolating. Yeah. just Yeah, I mean, there's so many. And, you know, I think the show that I'm doing right now is one of them, like being able to work with quilts and being able to work with artists who are living is great. I mean, I studied art from, you know, the 18th and 19th century. And so this is really novel for me, like getting to visit with artists and talk to them in their studios. Um, a historical show that I have in mind, though, relates back to uh, my dissertation research and thinking about how to translate all of that into a show about 19th century art that in engages social media. Um, so that's something that I have kind of on the back burner. Another thing that I really want would like to do is to continue working with, um, you know, contemporary artists, maybe one of them that's featured in this exhibition. Um, I would love to invite somebody who's an artist to come and help us um, stage kind of an intervention or to help us rethink our permanent collection and reframe it in a way that um, is more transhistorical and may connect with people in, you know, contemporary society. I, maybe this is a, just kind of a simple question for most people, but I'm still curious, like what what is the difference for a curator putting on a show with living in living in dead artists? Like what are the kind of hard, like they obviously with the living artists, you can have the dialogues, but like, what are like some of the hardships as a curator of obtaining work and how, how does that work? And does it ever stop you in your tracks being like, okay, this is going to be so, so difficult because they're they're They've been dead for 300 years and it's going to be hard to put something together. It's, Two, yeah, two really different experiences when when they're not living, the things that you have to rely on when you're interpreting their work are, you know, the work that other scholars have done on them in the past, and also the archive. Um, and I think that sometimes a lot of what we end up seeing is a result of the archival materials that are available to us. You know, you want to be able to um, be able to turn back to the artist's voice and to let that artist have a say in, in some of the way that you're interpreting the work. But in other ways, I think that um, there are, that the way that you can interpret a work of art over time changes based on different historical circumstances. It's you know something that the artist had never even thought of could come into play when um, audiences from a different time period are looking at it. So, you know, working with an artist who's living is a luxury in a way. You're able to, you know, see something that stands out to you in, in their work and you can just email them or call them and ask, like, is this what you had in mind when, when you did that? Um, and, you know, the ability to uh, work with them on commissions as well is something that is, you know, kind of a separate thing, but is also really special. Um, I don't know if this is a dumb question or not. Uh, did let's keep it coming. Did, did museums like did they just suddenly start working with living artists, or have they always worked with living artists and you just didn't notice it as much, or was there something that happened? And if something happened, what was that thing? Yeah, because as a kid, I, every every I felt like every museum was just dead artists. It was, like I never, yeah. I, it was no never definitely dead no people. Re recollection of a living artist. Oh. Yeah. No, that's a great question. Um, and I think like when we're, you know, here today and we go to museums, like so much of the work is uh, is by artists who are no longer living. But when, you know, so for instance, in, in the United States, when museum institutions came about, like in the, you know, mid to late 19th century, um, I think institutions like the Met were founded in sometime around 1870. They were collecting historical work from all over the world. Because, um, of course, 
so many artists who'd been creating for millennia were no longer living at that point. But there were artists that, you know, are canonical, like that are, um, you know, the most, some of the most famous 19th century artists in our collections today that were living at the time and who had relationships with um, some of the founding members of these institutions and had works that were being commissioned and purchased. And, you know, the patrons and the artists had um, strong relationships and those works, you know, were contemporary art at the time and they were being acquired by museum institutions for sure. Do American museums have the same questionable history uh, that all the British ones have? I mean, yeah. So, I mean, I think that that goes back to, you know, the ways in which museum institutions have contributed to those, you know, darker histories. But I will say that there are, um, you know, strong repatriation programs. And we're always trying to be very transparent about what it is we have and to document the provenance of everything so that we're, you know, we try very hard not to be complicit with that. Mm, What is your favorite work in radical tradition? Oh, my gosh. That's an impossible question. I know. That's why uh, I asked it. <laughs> what, okay. So what, or maybe what, um, what is like your favorite kind of cluster of storytelling in the, in the show? They're all so great. Like I really can't have a favorite, but I mean, one that's popping to mind and one that I know that you guys are familiar with is um, the work by Bisa Butler that we just acquired that we're featuring in this exhibition is just incredible. And we, um, so it's a quilted portrait of Frederick Douglass and, you know, Bisa's work, she typically, um, she typically is portraying African-American people from history who've been forgotten and she mines photographic archives and will portray people who we don't know. And, but in this instance, um, you know, she, decided to portray the great Frederick Douglass. And it's just this really powerful work. And we, we've had it hanging in our American galleries for the past few months. And I love, um, you know, kind of walking through the galleries sort of incognito and just overhearing what people say and how they respond to it when they turn the corner and they see it. And it's just, it's been really powerful. Um, and so in this exhibition, that work will be in conversation with other quilts that focus on themes of racial justice. Um, and so there, there's another quilt that we have on loan um, that was created in 1851, which is, you know, contemporaneous with Frederick Douglass. Like, so the quilt by Bisa Butler that we have is called um, The Storm, the Whirlwind, and the Earthquake. And that is a line that was taken from probably the most famous speech that Frederick Douglass ever gave, um, what to the slave is the 4th of July, which, which was given on uh, July 5th, 1852. And in that speech, he was kind of admonishing the celebration of independence during a time when slavery was still, um, you know, rampant in the South. And he said that, you know, it's not the light we need, but fire. It's not the gentle shower, but thunder. We need the storm, the whirlwind, and the earthquake. And so as he's giving that speech, this quilt that will be um, kind of situated in conversation with it was, um, it's a cradle quilt, and it was created to help advance the abolition movement. Um, Women during that period were creating quilts to raise funds to help support abolitionism and put an end to slavery. And it has this really powerful inscription below it that's, you know, also admonishing slavery, the institution of slavery in the South. And so, you know, having that historical um, connection next to a contemporary object and putting these two artists who are separated by like almost 200 years in conversation with one another is something that I've tried to do throughout the exhibition. But I think this is one of one of the high points. How do archivists um, preserve quilts? Is it a complicated process? Um, because I, you know, I understand a little bit about how cleaning and and kind of and how archivists maybe deal with paintings, but with quilts, uh, I have no idea how that would go. I've been able to learn a little bit about this through that process, through the process of organizing this show as well. Um, so we have a conservation team on staff and. One of our uh, one of our conservators specializes in textiles, and so I've been able to learn a little bit about 
um, about how that works. And it really just, it, it, I know it's very dependent upon the type of material. Silk, for instance, is incredibly fragile. And, you know, the, these objects have to be treated very, very carefully. And some of the loans that we've received have had to undergo um, treatment and conservation before they were sent here in order to stabilize um, the materials, they, some of them, some of the older quilts will have to be displayed on slant boards because just the pull of gravity when, when you hang a big, heavy object like that would be too much for the fibers. So, you know, there are all kinds of things to consider when it comes to cleaning um, and installation. Conservationalist. Why did I say archivist? Okay. Oh, makes sense. My brain Yeah, is, I think it's going uh, to it's, 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 translate fine. It's 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 early for me here still. So in a in a, in a couple of weeks when you've got hordes of listeners coming to Toledo for the first time, uh, <laughs> what what should they check out? Where, what neighbor, neighborhood? Uh, what are you going to give a shout out to? Because you're putting Toledo on the map right now. Yeah, exactly. This is a first. Yeah. This oh is a gosh. first for us on Radio Jugs. Yeah, I mean, I have to say, you know, check out downtown Toledo. There are a lot of really exciting things happening um, down there, but. I have to give a shout out to the Old West End, which is um, the neighborhood where I live. It's the neighborhood where the museum is located. And it's this really incredible historic neighborhood that um, has a really interesting past. A lot of the houses here were constructed in the late 19th century. And I think it's like one of the largest historic neighborhoods in the country. Okay, that was good. That was, okay. s- that was good. Strong. Yeah. You represented well there. Yeah, no, I. It's great talking to you today because we actually, you know, we Doug and I were really have been wanting to speak with somebody uh, who's had to curate a show during these sort of continually shaky, sometimes strong, sometimes crappy times yeah. that we are going through right now. Um, but it's really exciting that the museum is open. The show gets to open. Uh, it's excited, to, exciting just to celebrate Pisa Butler one more time. Mm. Um, for our for during this issue run um i guess i was curious if there was something that you learned from this show that surprised you in the end considering that you have spent some time on this subject before but was there something that kind of shifted your perspective a little bit that you could maybe share with us as we kind of conclude i mean i think that that was a process that was kind of constantly happening as I was organizing the show. When I um, initially started thinking about doing this exhibition, it was going to be a show about historical quilts. And so as I, you know, one by one, I would come across these artists who who were incorporating quilt making into their practices today. And um, in ways that draw these really strong connections between quilt making of the past and contempor- the interests of contemporary artists today. And I think, you know, that that was sort of the thing that was really compelling to me and that was, you know, surprising in a lot of ways. And so that is something that really steered the direction of the exhibition in a, in a powerful way. How heavy is that Frederick Douglass quilt? Is it heavy? Lauren, thank you so much for yeah. your time today. Thank you. I really appreciate it. It's uh, It's been great talking with you guys.